So we're going to have a few speakers. Um, I'm Joe Lombardo, uh, UNECO coordinator. Um, I was recently at the uh, NATO conference in, in Brussels to uh, be one of the representatives of the U.S. anti-war movement in the protests and alternative conferences that took place there, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But we're going to start with Ray McGovern, because he's going to give us um, a little bit of a background, and he's going to show uh, a short uh, video. And Ray is a former Army um, infantry intelligence officer and CIA analyst who served under seven presidents and nine CIA directors. He was one of the senior analysts who prepared and briefed the president's daily briefs. Um, he also chairs the National Intelligence. He also chaired the National Intelligence Estimates and a co-founder of Veterans Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. Um, and here's Ray. Well, um, here I'm talking about NATO, which I've called a vestigial organ, like an appendix, you know, that occasionally gets infected and you have to take it out. Uh, long since outlived its usefulness. And, uh, you know, that's not new. What was its usefulness? Well, I think to put a little perspective on this, I want to time myself here so that I don't go over. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, find my cell phone, but I'll, I'll do that later. Um, could you time me, Joe? Eight minutes? Yes. Uh, the perspective I'd like to put on it goes way back to after the war, that is, the Second World War. I'm proud of having been alive for the entire period, having been born one week after Hitler's tanks rolled into Poland. Uh, I don't remember a lot about the war itself, but the immediate after the war period, I remember very vividly. And I'm much shorter than my, my younger brothers because I tell them we had no steak and not much to eat during the war. A little bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> But what I will say is that uh, after the war, uh, the, the challenge became, well, what are we going to do now in terms of foreign policy? And they hired uh, the best foreign policy buff, George Kennan, who had been uh, ambassador to Moscow, author of the containment policy. And he did the first uh, foreign policy statement for the new policy planning group in the, in the State Department. This is what he says. We have 50% of the world's wealth, but only 6.3% of its population. So we cannot fail to be the object of some envy and resentment for all we have. So our task is to make sure that we keep this disparity. Now to do that, we're gonna to have to dispense with all sentimentality, daydreaming. We can't deceive ourselves into thinking that we can award, that we can uh, use the altruism of, well, the luxury of altruism, we just got to get rid of that. Uh, it's going to be necessary to exert hard power, and probably sooner rather than later. That's George Kennan. He used to be my idol. That's what he said right after the war. So this is the, the 1%, the patrician, indispensable country perspective. And that's what we've seen playing out ever since. So fast forward now to uh, uh, when it became a live issue as to whether to allow Ukraine and Georgia into NATO after NATO had doubled its size, reversing the promise that George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush and uh, Jim Baker had made to Gorbachev and Shevardnadze. And what happens then? Well, then we have um, uh, George Kennan, who was not only a patrician and, a, you know, sort of an altruist for the one percent, let's put it that way. Uh, he says, you know, um, to, to, to embrace the, the idea of 
expanding NATO, uh, this would be the, quote, the most fateful era of American policy in the entire post-war period. Whoa, that's George Kennan, 1997. So now I'd like to fast forward to 2008. NATO more than doubles, okay? In 2008, Bill Bradley, Senator Bill Bradley, who played basketball for the Knicks, some of you remember, uh, he was a Rhodes Scholar and he had done a lot of study in Russia. And he was disconsolate in a speech he made, I was gonna have the clip here, um, at the Carnegie Foundation. And he talked about being incredibly sad, talking about a, a monumental strategic error, and that error, of course, was to expand NATO. He said, I just don't understand. What, what do they have in mind? He says, it doesn't make any sense. Of course, he's a big pal of uh, Bill Clinton, who was responsible for most of this. So that was the 23rd of January, 2008. The 1st of February, 2008, uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov from Russia summons our ambassador in Bill Burns at the time. Now, I'm going to quote from the cable, and the reason we have the cable is thanks to Chelsea Manning <laughs> and Julian Assange. Now, that's, that's the thing about these WikiLeaks things. It's documents, right? So when somebody says to you, well, I don't, I don't know what General Julian Assange's take on this is. Well, he doesn't have a take. You know, he's, he's got documents, all right? And this is one of these documents. I've, I've seen one cable from Embassy Moscow. I must have read about 5,000 of them. I know what they look like. This is for real. February 1. Uh, here's uh, the report from Bill Burns. Uh, Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister, invited me in today. And he kind of read the riot act to me. He said, Mr. 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 Burns, do you know what NYET means? And of course, I said, yeah. he said, well, NYET means NYET. We hear these rumors that you are about to invite Ukraine and Georgia into NATO. NYET means NYET. Do you understand that, Mr. Burns? Yes, I understand. Because if you try to attract Ukraine into NATO, there will be civil war in Ukraine, and we will have to decide whether we have to intervene on that or not. Do you understand? He says, yes. Will you report that to Condoleezza Rice or whatever her name is? Yes, I will. Okay. And he did. He played it straight. The title was, Nyet means Nyet, Russia's Red Line on Ukrainian Participation in NATO, February 1st, 2008. <laughs> April 3rd, 2008, NATO, at a summit in Bucharest, decides Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO. Whoa, why would they do that? Well, because uh, the US and NATO has had their have, have free reign to do whatever they want while uh, Russia was debilitated. <coughs> Fast forward to, two, to 2014, one regime change, try too many, okay? They do a putsch, they do a, a coup d'etat, in Kiev, uh, George Friedman of Stratfor called it uh, the most blatant coup in history. And he's quite right because it was advertised 18 days before on YouTube, okay? You mostly know that story, I hope. Anyhow, the coup happens and, uh, and then make the, the Russians react as anyone who knows anything about his, history would have seen. So that's, wh that's where we are now. Uh, that's where we are with respect to Ukraine. It's a cause celeb, uh, and uh, the whole deal was that after we promised the Russians not to uh, expand NATO, well, the word was one inch farther east beyond East Germany, that was the quid, okay? We said, look, Gorbachev, Shevardnadze, this is the deal, you know? We won't. We won't expand NATO one inch to the east of Germany uh, if, if you want. Well, all we're asking is that you, you accept the reunited Germany and pull your 300,000 troops, your crackerjack troops out of East Germany. Well, that's all we're asking. Now, 
you're a well-educated audience. How many Russians died at the hands of the Germans in World War II? Anybody know? 20 million. Yeah, 27 million. Okay. Now, what was the whole policy of East and West with respect to Germany after World War II? They keep it divided, right? Now, when I heard the, you know, the Berlin Wall fell, that's great. But when I heard that Germany was going to be reunited, I said, oh my God, I don't want that. I have several very close German. I lived in Germany for five years. It scared me to death. And I didn't lose any relatives in World War II, like Putin did. So what I want to do is a little put, a, put a little perspective on this. You know that two of his brothers died, one in the siege of Leningrad from, from hunger, apparently. I strongly suggest that to get an idea of what Putin is all about, you watch Oliver Stone's magnificent four-part com commentary, and then you look at uh, Megyn Kelly uh, talking to Putin. The contrast is obscene, uh, and there are a couple of articles written, one by me uh, on raymcgovern.com, critiquing Megyn Kelly and, exp and trying to explain uh, why uh, Putin was saying what he did in answer to her questions. So I wanted to lay the foundation for how we got to where we are now with NATO. Last thing I'll sim simply say is that you know, everyone says, oh, isn't it terrible what, what Trump is doing? My God, you know, he's asking them to pay more. Well, my, my take on that is that this is the beginning of the end of NATO, and that's a good thing. Why is it the beginning of the end? Well, because when these people are asked to pony up more money, they're going to say, oh, we need that money. Well, yeah. Why do we have to pony it? And then somebody say, well, because the Russians. And then somebody else is going to say, what about the Russians? And they're going to say, well, the Russian threat. And then somebody will say, you know, how many people believe that the Russians are going to invade Europe? Please raise your hand. And nobody's going to raise their hand. And they're not going to fund NATO anymore. And they can find more useful uh, purposes. And, you know, when you think about one billion, one hundred million dollars of our taxpayer and other taxpayer money going into building this, this obscene edifice in Brussels that they were commemorating just a couple months ago, well, I know what they should do with that. They should divide it into little places where the millions, millions of refugees coming from Syria, coming from Iraq, coming from Afghanistan, coming from Libya, where, where if they survived the trip, they would have a decent place to live. That's what NATO should be doing. Thanks very much. So I'm just going to very briefly tell you a little bit about my trip to um, Belgium to protest uh, NATO a couple weeks ago um, because we have some really impressive speakers at this um, workshop that I'd like you to hear, so I'm not going to spend too much time. but. Um, I was asked to go to uh, protest um, at the NATO summit uh, that took place in, what, the 24th and 25th, or 25th and 26th in, of May um, in Brussels. Uh, there were two alternative summit conferences that took place. Um, that was a little failure on the part of the movement because they're going through the same thing that we are, which is called sectarianism. So rather than having one conference, they had two. Um, I spoke at both, um, and uh, they were both very interesting. One was uh, sponsored by the uh, World Peace Council, and people were there from 17 countries. Uh, the other was sponsored by a group of groups, um, including No to War, No to NATO, um, and some others, and uh, that was uh, also a very interesting uh, uh, conference. At that one, I was asked to speak on the um, expansion of NATO, and Ray talked about this, that after the fall of, of the Soviet Union, we had promised that we were not going to expand NATO into the former uh, Russian territories or into the former Soviet territories or to the former Warsaw Pact countries. Um, and uh, the fact is that NATO, which started out as 12 countries, um, 10 from Europe and United States and Canada, uh, has now expanded to 28. And they include the countries that we 
said we would not expand to, including Albania, Bulgaria, Croatia, Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia. Um, but the real worry right now for NATO is what they're doing around Russia. And this fits into what's happening with Ukraine, because Ukraine has the longest border with Russia of any country. And they want to surround Russia. We have so-called missile defense there. Missile defense basically is an offensive weapon. It's so if the US does a first strike, we could stop any attempt at a retaliation. That's the way Russians see it, and that's the way it is. We've done war games practically in sight of the Russian border, and yet when Russian troops move up to their own border to protect themselves in case these war games ever went across the border, we say that's an aggressive act. Uh, it's a very strange thing. They're not doing war board games on our border. They're not putting missiles on our border, but they are the aggressors. Well, the wars the U.S. has fought have been in small countries with weak militaries. Afghanistan, one of the poorest countries in the world, the longest war we've ever been in, we can't win it. But Russia is a nuclear power, and that war can really engulf the entire war, the entire world in a way that we don't want to see. So when you see 24-7 on MSNBC and CNN the vilification of Russia, it is like what they do before they lead up to any war. They vilify the leader so they can say that we're doing it for humanitarian reasons. Don't believe it. Now they say this is all around interference in our elections. Well, here's Time Magazine, um, a picture of Putin looking very dour and very, not very nice. I should have blown this up. But basically it says, Russia wants to undermine um, uh, faith in the US elections. Don't fall for it. Here's Time Magazine from the early 1990s. Uh, there's a picture of Yeltsin there with an American flag. And the caption reads, uh, the secret story of how American advisors helped Yeltsin win. The United States intervenes in elections and the internal affairs of countries all throughout the world. We set up um, opposition parties if we don't like the government that's in power. We do economic sanctions to try to make the people turn against the government in power. If those don't work, we do coups. If those don't work, we do regime change wars. And that's what all these wars are about. But a regime change war with Russia is something else. And so that's why it was important to be at the NATO conference. That's why it's important that as Trump builds his walls, we build bridges with these people, because it is against the interest of the Europeans, it's against the interest of the Americans, it's against the interest of people all over the world. And so that gives us the potential to unite with these people and stop this aggressive act and this aggressive organization known as NATO. Thanks. Um, our next speaker is uh, Nicola, I'm gonna really destroy this, Verzik, he is, Verzic, he's from Serbia. Um, he is the deputy editor-in-chief of Paket, uh, which is a political week weekly in Belgrade. He hosts uh, New Sputnik Order radio talk show um, of Sputnik Serbia. He is the author of WikiLeaks, The Secret, um, the Secrets of the Belgrade Cables, and uh, the third bullet, a political background of the assassination of Zoran Dijinic. Sorry. <laughs> um, so anyway, here is uh, Nikolaya. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, Good morning. I'm glad to, to be here to share my uh, thoughts and some information about what, what happened to my country, uh, Serbia, back in the early 90s. Uh, Serbia had that uh, misfortune, but also maybe a privilege to, to be among the first to, uh, on the receiving end of that uh, new world order uh, that was formed after the, the collapse of, of the Soviet Union. 
the consequences uh, were really devastating. Uh, international sa sanctions that were imposed on, on Serbia in 92, uh, only a year later, we raised almost 60% of, of Serbian uh, e economy. Uh, so, uh, the country had to... Um, there was also this uh, huge social impact because uh, uh, we had to smuggle inside the country everything that was basically essential. And, uh, of course, uh, criminals and not uh, librarians or university professors were the ones who, who were doing the, the smuggling. So they rose in prominence and wealth and uh, uh, that created, as I said, this impact that uh, we feel even a quarter of a century later. Uh, then came the NATO bombing in 99, uh, which was focused more on civilian infrastructure than on uh, military uh, targets. Uh, the damage was estimated somewhere between uh, 30 and 100 billion billion dollars, vast sum of money for already in impoverished country. Uh, but it was all well de deserved, at least that according to the corporate media and the Hague Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, uh, because. As I said, Serbia wanted to create Greater Serbia. Serbs committed almost all of the atrocities in the wars that were started because of this uh, genocidal ideology. And uh, the Hague Tribunal provided the proof. It sentenced uh, Serbs uh, for more than uh, 1,100 years of, of prison for their crimes against uh, Croats, Bosnians, and Albanians, uh, while all of them were punished with only uh, 63 and a half years of prison for their crimes uh, against Serbs. Uh, however, uh, the question is, should we accept this truth as, uh, as it was established by, by the, the Western media and uh, the Hague Tribunal? Uh, connections between Western corporate media and the uh, intelligence community are well known. Uh, Wikileaks is uh, US diplomatic cables that were already mentioned. Uh, they also re uh, revealed that uh, both the president and tribunal's uh, chief prosecutors were profoundly connected to, to Washington's administration. Uh, the cables described, for example, uh, tribunal's president, Theodore Meron, as a man whose uh, initiatives, priorities, and concerns track closely with US government thinking. Uh, chief prosecutor Je Jeffrey Nice was a uh, protected source, meaning informant of, uh, of US embassy in Netherlands. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I've been warned that I'm speaking too fast. But I have this time limit, limit on my mind, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the cables also showed that uh, both the chief prosecutor and the tribunal's president uh, consulted with the Americans even about the content of their uh, presentations to the United Nations Security Council. Uh, so, uh, if we put it all together, if we connect the dots, uh, we know the uh, United States themselves were involved in Yugoslav wars, fighting against Serbs in, uh, in Croatia, in Bosnia, and in Kosovo. Uh, their collaborators in corporate media and the, the Hague, Hague Tribunal. Uh, I think that uh, we should uh, come to a conclusion that uh, their version of truth is ju just that. Uh, one version of truth that was created by, by the, the, the people that were involved in, in, in the events. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there are numerous, uh, uh, numerous evidence uh, surf surfaced that uh, bring this, this established truth to, into, into doubt. Uh, sanctions against Serbia, for example, they were imposed after a bomb killed a number of civilians in a bread queue in uh, Vasemiskina Street in, in Sarajevo. So uh, Bosnian Serbs were immediately accused of, of that uh, atrocity. But a uh, quarter of a century later, the, the Hague Tribunal quietly dropped that charge for, uh, against Radovan Karadžić and Ratko Mladic, leaders of, of Bosnian Serbs. Uh, does it mean that uh, the sanctions against Serbia were imposed under a false pretext? This is what uh, the independent newspaper from, from London wrote on August 22nd, 1992, several months after that, that bomb fell. UN officials and senior Western military officers believe some of the worst recent, re recent killings in Sarajevo, including the massacre of at least 16 people in a bread queue, were carried out by the city's uh, defenders, not Ser Serb besiegers, as a propaganda ploy to win world si uh, sympathy and military intervention. The view has been expressed in confidential reports cir circulating at UN headquarters in New York and in classified briefings to US policy make makers in Washington. Bosnia war itself could have been avoided, but the U.S. decided otherwise. Uh, this is what former Prime Minister of Sweden, Karl Bildt, uh, wrote two, two, two years ago. And Karl Bildt was an uh, American envoy, envoy in, in Bosnia after the, the war, so the man of the, of, the, of the establishment. So this is what he said. 
the basic, the, the basic structure of the uh, Carrington Cotillero plan from March 92, which was before the, the, the war broke, was actually fairly similar to the deal that emerged in Dayton nearly four years later. That's the, the deal that stopped the, the, the war. Uh, if you were to ask the first European com uh, community negotiator, Lord, Lord Carrington, he would say with conviction that it was the United States that encouraged the Bosnian Muslim leader, President Alija Izetbegovic, to walk away from that deal. Carol Bild goes on to, the, to 1993. He, here's what he says. The story of how former U.S. Secretary of State Cyrus Vance and former United Kingdom uh, Foreign Sec Secretary David Owen in 93 failed is still the subject of some con controversy. David Owen uh, makes no secret of his view that the new administration in Washington undercut and abandoned the effort. Owen adds that uh, the, the, the real effect of, of U.S. Uh, policy was to prolong the, the, the war in Bosnia, not to stop it. These are strong words, says Carol Bildt, and the files of Cyrus Vance, who obviously felt abandoned by Washington, will remain closed for many years yet." End of the quote. By the way, the, the, the same, secret is, same, same secrecy is applied uh, regarding the Srebrenica massacre. Uh, UN Security Council decided in 95, upon the initiative of USA, France, and, and Great Britain, uh, to, to archive the, the entire UN Srebrenica documentation for the next 30 to, to, to 50 years, without disclosing it even to the, to the Hague Tribunal. Why the secrecy if there is nothing to hide? And the Kosovo War, this is what uh, Noam Chomsky wrote in, uh, in two, uh, 2008. In his preface to a book on NATO's bombing of Serbia by his associate uh, John Norris, Strobe Tal Talbot, former US Deputy uh, Secretary of State, State writes that those who want to know should turn to Norris's well-informed account. Norris concludes that it was Yugoslavia's resistance to the broader trends of political and economic reform, not the plight of Kosovo Albanians, that best explains uh, NATO's war. In the same tone, in the same tone uh, Henry Kissinger said regarding the ne negotiations in Rambouillet, whose failure led to the war. The Rambouillet text, which called on Serbia to admit NATO troops throughout Yugoslavia, was a provocation, an excuse to start the bombing. And another account from former State, State Department official George Kenney. A senior State Department official had bragged that the United States deliberately set the bar higher than the Serbs could accept. The Serbs needed, according to the official, a little bombing to see the reason. So the bottom line is, uh, it was not Serbia, but the United Sta uh, States that wanted the uh, war scene in for former Yugoslavia. Why? That is maybe the, the crucial question. And I think there are several reasons for that. The first one is uh, Serbia itself, as it is the largest, largest country in the region and its political fulcrum, as uh, your Senator John McCain recently said. And of course, Balkans is uh, the, the soft underbelly of Europe, as Winston Churchill said maybe a century ago. So uh, Serbia as such uh, had to stop resisting to the above-mentioned broader trends of political and economic re reforms. Um, secondly, after the fall of, of the Soviet Union, NATO had to find a reason for its uh, continu continued existence. Third, by bombing Serbia in 99, it showed that it can uh, intervene militarily without the approval of the United Nations, that it, it can break the, the international law without any consequences. And finally, uh, Balkans is the place where this uh, responsibility to protect doctrine was formulated, paving the way for other uh, seemingly noble humanitarian interventions uh, that killed millions of people all around the world, uh, while, of course, con uh, conveniently serving the interests of Washington's political and business elite. Thank you. I really want to encourage people um, the rest of the weekend to uh, find um, uh, Nikolai and our next speaker, um, who are international guests from countries that the U.S. has been enemies with, and talk to them, speak to them, and uh, learn from them. Our next speaker is, I'm going to mess this up really badly, um, Ludmilia uh, you have to pronounce your last yes, name for me. It's very difficult to pronounce my, my, my surname, Lyudmila Pichisheva. Okay. She's associate professor at, a professor at Russian State University for humani uh, Humanities. She's a volunteer activist, volunteer work with the uh, Russian World Patriotic Veterans and research related to the Holocaust. Uh, in the International Sciences and Education Center of the History of the Holocaust uh, at her university. Uh, you. 
Thank you so much. Good morning, uh, my dear colleagues. I'm really uh, glad uh, to be here and to take part in this conference because it's the first time that I participate in such a conference, the UNEC, UNEC conference. Uh, so I think that it's a very interesting topic that I'm going to be touch, um, the, cur uh, the current anti-governmental protests in Russia. Um, first of all, um, to my mind, one of the most effective tools of the spread of democratic ideas and values is the so-called colored column of flower revolutions as a non-violent action with the usage of non-violent resistance and a great pressure on the governmental institutions for change. Mm, you know that it's a very interesting um, uh, book that I have just read um, from Dictatorship to Democracy, a conceptual framework for liberation that was written by a very well-known US um, scientist, Gene Sharp, and he created one, uh, 198 methods uh, of non-violent non action that have inspired and informed uprisings, riots, revolutions across the globe. And this is a technology, the new technology that is widespread all over the globe. So, uh, today color, uh, color revolutions can be regarded as a new form of uh, where, uh, where warfare financially and ideologically supported by international uh, non-governmental organizations, first of all, the US uh, non-governmental organizations and lobbying groups aimed at uh, serving their interests and meeting both their political and economic goals. Um, Russia with its uh, huge territory and um, uh, resources, natural resources, gas, oil, uh, human capital, and um, military might is no exception on this list. And um, elections or governmental reforms are the best pretext uh, of the position, today's opposition, uh, to act promptly and to have a huge impact on the state, on the, the government. Uh, if we take uh, a, gl a glance look uh, at the results of college revolutions, for example, in Serbia, 2000, Georgia, 2003, um, Kyrgyzstan, 2005, we can see economic recession, stagnations, uh, turmoil, um, and the decline in different spheres and realms. And um, due to liquid and secessional uh, disclosure of politicians, ordinary people, I mean uh, Russian people, have understood the danger of such cult revolutions. And I would like to say that uh, the position um, a position I can I can name some of the well-known uh, positionist activists such as Navalny, Chirikova, um, Yashin, etc. Uh, can't come up with a well-balanced agenda and progressive political program because political populism without any certain political platform and program that has become a stable political rhetoric is the most effective means for the Russian opposition that applies it in a proper way and wows the public. So I think that um, protests and uh, demonstrations are the essential part of any civil society. In, 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 but I think that ultimately um, protests um, should not undermine the regime, the country, and throw down the state institutions. Thank you so much. And I would like to say that I have just mentioned the motto, uh, money for jobs, education, Medicare, but not for war. And I would like to say that as I stand for this motto and, and um, yeah, I would like to thank you and um, thank you so much for your attention and thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
um, our final speaker, and, and then I'm hoping we can have some time for um, some discussion from the floor and questions of the speakers. Our final speaker is Bruce Gagnon. Um, Bruce was uh, trained by the United Farm Workers Union as an organizer for the fruit pickers in Florida. He coordinates the global network against weapons and nuclear power in space and lives in Bath, Maine. Bruce is also a veteran, a war era, era vet, uh, and a member of Veterans for Peace. Um, Bruce was also part of a delegation that UNAC um, organized last May 2nd, a year ago, uh, to go to Odessa, where uh, people came together uh, to protest the massacre that was carried out by right-wing and fascist forces against folks at the um, House of Trade Unions in Odessa. Uh, that demonstration, uh, the right wing wanted to stop it, and they threatened to attack it, that a fascist threatened to attack it, just like they had done um, uh, May 2nd in 2014. Um, it was organized by the Mothers Committee, which is a committee of relatives of people that died. Bruce, um, uh, along with Phil Aledo right here, was taking a picture, um, were two of the people that were on that delegation uh, their bus was attacked, um, but not seriously, and the fascists did come to the demonstration, but were unable to break it up, and hundreds and, uh, of people showed up to uh, protest what happened on May 2nd. There's Bruce. Actually, thousands, thousands, thousands of Odessans and people from around the world came to that uh, gathering to be with the Mothers Committee. Let me start out by saying that one of the big problems we have in the United States today is that many liberal Democrats are helping to lead us to war with Russia. The Putin demonization that is being led by the Democrats today, what I call nothing more than recycled red baiting, is really intended to disguise their own electoral failures in the last election by blaming Hillary Clinton's implosion, electoral implosion, by blaming that on Russia and Vladimir Putin in particular. And by doing this, the liberal Democrats, many of whom I know and have known for years, they become unwitting agents of the neocons in the United States deep state who want regime change in Syria, in Iran, and Russia. And it's really disgusting what is coming out of the mouths of the Democratic Party, both at the leadership level and even in, in from the grassroots people today. And I think we all need to call out the Democratic Party as often as possible. I've been following the Ukrainian situation every day since early 2014. When I followed the whole Maidan and everything that happened afterwards, online, watching videos on YouTube, and it's been an education and a heartbreaking experience for me. So when I had the opportunity in 2014, along with Phil and uh, my friend Regis Tremley, a filmmaker from Maine, to go to Odessa to stand with the Mothers Committee, who were trying, are still trying, to bring justice uh, to their uh, sons and daughters who were massacred in May of uh, 2014 at the Trades Hall in Odessa by Nazis. Uh, I, I, I was happy to go to Odessa to stand with, with the people there. I've watched endless videos about that massacre where people were outside essentially tabling and they were attacked by the Nazis. They ran inside the building, barricaded the door. Molotov cocktails were thrown 
at the building, a fire started outside and inside the building. People climbed out onto the window ledges to get air as the smoke was literally killing them inside. They were shot at by people outside, easily identified in videos, shooting guns at the people at the windows. Some of them jumped out, fell to the ground, and were beaten with bats. Some of them killed right on the spot. The Nazis blocked the fire department from coming to put out the fire. Many of the Nazis went into the building through a side door with gas masks on, clear that they had planned the entire operation because they had all the tools necessary to get inside the building with gas masks and went in and killed people. Even a pregnant woman inside the building was killed. People heard her screams outside. And today, no one has been found guilty for these crimes, even though there's voluminous video evidence of these crimes. But in fact, the people that are being arrested continually, even still today, are the parents and the supporters of the people that were killed inside by the Nazis on that occasion. These are crimes, and that we all should be speaking out about them today here in the United States of America. In Western Ukraine today, the United States Special Forces from Fort Carson, Colorado, are training Nazis that have been brought into the newly formed National Guard. There's a video online on YouTube. You can see the Obama ambassador to Ukraine, US ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Piot. You can see him taking a train to this base where he congratulates everyone uh, on this wonderful uh, situation going on there, the training of this National Guard, who were then sent to eastern Ukraine, to the Donbass, where they attack daily, attack by shelling people, by shooting people, snipers. Uh, they attack people, killing people by the thousands. This has been going on for several years now under the direction of the United States and NATO. Regis Tremley, the filmmaker, his son is in the US Army Special Forces. And is to the, at this moment, at this very base in Western Ukraine, training these Nazis on behalf of the United States and NATO. It's absolutely sick what is going on. I keep wanting to get to the bottom of the reasons for the US wanting regime change in Russia. What's the reason? And I've come to two conclusions. I'm sure there are many other reasons, but two of the principal conclusions in my mind. Number one is climate change. Because of climate change and the melting of the Arctic ice, it is now possible to drill baby drill up in the Arctic. And the oil corporations of the United States and Britain and France and other NATO countries understand that Russia has the largest land border with the Arctic of any country on the Earth. I, know, I understand there's a RAND Corporation study talking about the balkanization of Russia, breaking it up into constituent countries, into pieces, so that the oil corporations would have easier access to this region. But this kind of program to balkanize Russia is a massive military undertaking that requires a lot of money. And the American people will never go along with this unless there is some kind of demonization of Russia and Vladimir Putin. And this is what the program is about today, as far as I'm concerned. Additionally, the second reason is BRICS. The creation of the BRICS organization, BRICS standing for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, the development of Alternative Development Bank to challenge the power of the IMF and the World Bank that requires countries that get loans to uh, privatize their entire country, to sell off all the assets to international capitalism. 
And so the BRICS Bank wants to uh, challenge the IMF and the World Bank control of the global economy. And so this is sacrilegious to the international capitalist institutions. And so because of this desire on the behalf of BRICS to create a multipolar world rather than a unipolar world, this must be destroyed. And already we've seen in Brazil the ouster of the president of Brazil. And now, of course, we're seeing in Russia uh, the effort to destroy. Let me say, finally, that these kind of informations that I'm talking about are not available to the American people from our, our media. You have to go outside of our media. So I'd like to recommend three sources that I daily check for this information. One of them is a website called Fort Russ, R-U-S-S, -S, Fort Russ. I highly recommend it. Second one is Sputnik, a website called Sputnik. That's where um, Brian Becker has a radio show that you can also listen to. And thirdly, v Vineyard, Vineyard of the Saker, V-I-N-E-Y-I-R-D of the Saker, S-A-K-E-R. I highly recommend that website as well. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. So uh, I think we have some time for some questions and discussion. I just want to point out, because you mentioned Sputnik, um, you know, we sent out uh, press releases to all the major media in the United States to come to our conference, and of course they did not. Um, but uh, we did get Sputnik from Russia, TASS from Russia, and Channel One from Russia. They seem a little bit more interested in peace than our own news media. Uh, questions, discussion? Yes, this man here. Okay, I'd like to bring the uh, attention of the uh, Assembly to a domestic situation that has a great deal of bearing on everything that's been discussed, uh, which is that the senatorial Democrats, uh, plus McC McCain and Graham, are holding up uh, virtually all high-level uh, administrative appointments of Donald Trump. Uh, you've got a situation where there is only one Trump appointee who's been approved by the Senate in the Department of Defense, that's Mattis. There is a holdover named Bob Work. Uh, other than that, there, there are no high-level civilian appointees in uh, the Department of Defense. Uh, there are some acting people, but they're not approved by the Senate. Now, it's my opinion that under circumstances like that, we cannot speak of constitutional civilian control of the military. We have a civilian control of some kind, deep state, Wall Street, who knows what kind of, you know, cabal. Uh, you don't have to believe me. There's, uh, you know, do a web search, Trump political appointees, WikiLeaks, and you can see the situation. The State Department is in the same condition. I had opportunity to talk to a mid-level State Department employee about that situation. The way she described it was she said, uh, we have a uh, Secretary of State, but we don't have a State Department. There are no high-level people to give guidance to the mid the lower, middle and lower level people. And this is going nearly without uh, notice. And, you know, so we see these military actions going on in Syria and around the world. It's customary to blame them on Trump, but we don't really know who's responsible. And so we have to give attention to this, we have to bring it out, and we have, to have you know, uh, uh, in keeping with what Bruce was saying, we have to expose, uh, you know, the treacherous acts, particularly the Demo uh, Democrats, in undertaking something that, you know, goes far beyond malfeasance <coughs> and, uh, you know, make this known to the public. So I'd like to know, you know, uh, well, I guess uh, by way of a um, uh, question, I'd like to, you know, uh, ask for any responses uh, to, for, uh, to my Thank you. Uh, remarks from the panel. Okay. Why don't we see if there's any more questions, and then we, the panel can go down and answer everything because we don't have much time. Speaking about the expansion of NATO, I wasn't sure if anyone can answer this particular question because 
um, we have a situation, speaking about NATO, where they're involved in the geoengineering and chemtrails. I wasn't sure if anyone has any uh, opinion on this because, for example, as government officials, we're told that um, it's a last-ditch effort to stop global warming. But on the other hand, they were able to repair the hole in the ozone without dropping dangerous barium or aluminum, let's say back in the early 1990s. So perhaps okay, someone has you. something to say about that. Let's take the, the three that are lined up, and then we'll go, we'll go through. I just want to say a thank you to the board today. Thank and you. And it's a privilege to be here, to be witness to this, and I'm glad I came. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Uh, I want to know if you think that there is any um, substance to the uh, Russian interference in U.S. elections, collusion with uh, Trump, and can't we both think that possibly uh, that is true as well as be anti-war people and be uh, pro-good uh, uh, ties with the Russians? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is George Grunenthal. I just want to uh, see if we can have some discussion of what UNAC and other uh, anti-war forces can do to bring the whole question of NATO uh, and the role of both the Republicans and Democrats to a broader section of particularly working people in the United States. Uh, when the Soviet Union fell, we were all promised a peace dividend. Now that peace dividend has become a uh, $58 billion extra war dividend. <laughs> and I think it's something that we can use to really expose what, uh, what the role of the US has been under both Democrats and Republicans. But we have to do it in such a way that we reach out to broad layers of working people in the United States. OK. Can I suggest we start with Bruce and just come down the line and answer any or all of what you'd like to from the people that ask the questions? Uh, first, I would say th about the Russian interference in our elections, I think it's all a mirage. It's a distraction. The whole country is consumed with this question, well, our social uh, progress, system of social progress is being completely dismantled. Environmental protection is being completely dismantled and there's no, there's no air, there's no energy, there's no discussion about any of that. Uh, what little evidence has been brought forward has been very specious and lacking. And in fact, uh, there is no evidence of any Russian interference or election. The only thing I've heard the politicians directly claiming Russia has done is that RT, Russia Today Television, has, during the campaign, interviewed people that were critical of Hillary Clinton. That's the only evidence I've heard any of the politicians directly claim uh, that uh, Russia had done. So I, th I think it's, it, the whole thing is a distraction. About climate change, about uh, particularly uh, chemtrails, uh, chemtrails are real. Uh, just days ago, my sister was visiting from Iowa, and we were showing her around uh, parts of Maine where we live. And the whole sky from horizon to horizon in every direction was laced with chemtrails. It's real for sure. Uh, weather modification, the military has long talked about using weather modification as a weapon in the coming years. Uh, there's many reasons, I think, for uh, chemtrails uh, being laid down. Uh, but uh, it's certainly a real thing, no doubt about it. This is my turn, I hope so. Uh, thank you so much for such uh, questions, such interesting questions. And uh, I would like to say that uh, there are no um, clear facts and uh, in, in data and evidence that uh, the Russian government hammed or interfered in the elections. And um, that's, that's why I think that is just a conspiracy theory or something like this. And, that's it. Uh, so what about the new uh, world order? I would like to say that after the collapse of the USSR and the bipolar world order, uh, new um, actors, uh, new um, 
how to say, uh, states um, uh, try to find the niche. And we can see China, we can see India, Russia, and some Latin American countries and Asian countries that try to um, try to develop in their own way. And uh, I absolutely agree that uh, new uh, BRICS is not an organization. Uh, and it's very interesting that in 2001, Mr. O'Neill from Goldman Sachs uh, set up this operation BRIC and then BRICS. And uh, yes, BRICS. Uh, uh, groupings, the groupings with the banks, with the bank, uh, uh, now play a very important role uh, in the uh, new balance of power, in the new world order, and um, I think that we have to pay attention to these growing powers. Um, um, what to say? Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, brief, just uh, about the, this uh, interference thing. It's uh, coming from Serbia. It's really funny for me to to hear United States complaining about uh, someone interfering in their electoral uh, pr process. I mean, th that is what the United States has been doing in Serbia and in many other countries for quarter of a century, and uh, they uh, direct. There are numerous evidence back in 2008, for for example, they uh, directly. Uh, ordered uh, which parties w would would form the, the the government coalition. But um, as far as uh, uh, this uh, investigation in the United States is is concerned, there is one weird thing that stands out for me uh, is that uh, the FBI didn't uh, actually have access to those uh, DNC uh, servers. I mean, it's. Uh, this is such Amen. an important topic, and the FBI doesn't have access, but some private company that is linked to Atlantic Council, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, maybe you should comment on that. Yeah, well, I think you put your, your, your finger on, on the big lacuna here. Uh, there's a deep state, people, a real deep state. And it's the FBI, the CIA, NSA, sometimes others, but those are the three big ones. And which, were, which three did the uh, appraisal of Russian interference? Hmm, I think it was the same three, right? Now, there is no, I agree with Bruce, there's no evidence that Russia interfered. And, and you know, if you take a step back, well, everyone knew that Hillary's gonna win, right? I mean, everybody knew. Unless you submit that Vladimir Putin is clairvoyant, you know? then there was no percentage at all in his try to muck around with the DNC, you know? So that's one thing. Um, uh, the other thing is that, you know, we know how this evolved. The only piece of evidence that has been adduced to show that the Russians hacked into our election system to get Trump to win, because Putin wanted Trump to win, right? Now put yourself in Putin's place, right? You're sitting around the table and you're, you're watching the election campaign. You say, wow, this guy is really amazing. You know, I mean, he's unpredictable and he, he, he breaks about being unpredictable and, and he lashes out at the slightest real or imagined slight. I'm like, oh man, this is, this is gonna be great. If he wins, that just is just the guy that I wanna have his fingers on the nuclear codes. This is gonna be real fun. <laughs> I mean, I think I know something about Russian leaders. I've been studying them for 50 years, okay? It boggles the mind to think that Vladimir Putin or any other Russian sensible person would even uh, do, lift their finger to help Trump win. So the whole syllogism sort of falls apart. But what do we have in terms of evidence? Well, we have this commercial film, uh, firm called CrowdStrike, run by rabid NATO folks and with ties to Ukraine, okay? It's called CrowdStrike. So when, when WikiLeaks intervenes in the, uh, by revealing DNC documents, like, I mean, it's not made up. These are emails, these are documents, okay? So uh, this is two, two days before the Democratic National Convention. And Bernie has already tucked tail and said, well, you know, okay, well, all right, fine, you know, so. So what do these things say? These say that Hillary Clinton stole the, elect stole the nomination, Bernie Sanders. I mean, 
it's clear. Read them. How many have read the DNC then? Ah, one out. Oh, okay, well, that's unusual. They're three out of a hundred, okay? Now, what's, what was the deal? Well, what, here's Hillary. What are we going to do? My God, what's, what's Bernie going to do? Well, well, somebody said, we have to distract. We have to do a big distraction here. Um, I got an idea. We'll blame it on the Russians. Somebody else says, that's not Russians. It was, it was WikiLeaks. That's all right. That's okay. We'll say, yeah, that's what we'll say. WikiLeaks is working with the Russians. Okay. Now, the whole New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, everybody, the next day ran these stories. Why did the Russians hack into the DNC? Okay. Now, most of you know that it wasn't a hack at all. It was a leak, right? You put a thumb drive in there, and you get it to Julian Assange. That's what happened, okay? We know that because a hack would have gone over the system, and then NSA would know about it. So, long story short, you got a situation where CrowdStrike, and thanks for mentioning this, is the only forensics doer, okay? Now, Jim, James Comey, <coughs> that well-respected saint, uh, you know, he's the head of the FBI, and he's saying, oh, you know, we couldn't get access to the DNC computers. Huh? I know, he says to the, to the uh, House Committee, I don't know very well that, you know, you're, to do the job right, you have to have physical entree here to the forensic, but we had to rely on the CrowdStrike forensics. Now, give me a, a break, all right? You're the head of the FBI. You can't get access to the DNC computers. He didn't want access. It was all part of this cabal because he knew what was going on. Because you know what that Cyrillic came from? It came from a hack. But the hack was done by the CIA, not by the Russians. And you don't know that because it's not, well, how many people know that? Oh, wow, okay. It didn't make the New York Times, okay? How did they do it? Well, WikiLeaks revealed on the 31st of March that the CIA had developed a program in cooperation with NSA where they can hack into computers, servers, whatever, okay? And obfuscate, this is a fancy bureaucratic word, obfuscate, that's in the original CIA documents, Obfuscate who did it. Not only that, but they were in five languages. Cyrillic and four others. And they can leave telltale signs, like, oh, maybe a little Cyrillic there, to blame it on somebody else. That's what happened. Comey knows that's what happened. And that's why he said, oh, no, please, you know, don't, don't send any of our technicians into the, to, to look at the, at the DNC computers, because they might come back and say, Oh my God, Director Comey, you know what we found? We found a, a system that's so sophisticated that CrowdStrike can never figure it out. We can't figure it out. I got an idea. Let's go check with NSA. <laughs> Ray, so they'd have to, they'd have to. Let's hear from the. Uh, yeah, let me yeah, just okay. quickly say one thing mm -hmm. about this is they haven't shown one piece of proof. The only proof they have is that 17 agencies, spy agencies in this country all agree that it was the Russians. But well, that's wrong. First of all, we have 17 spy agencies. It's only Why the hell do we have 17 spy agencies? And, um, you know, so that's, that's the major piece that we should get away from this. There's only three of them, Joe. Only three of them. I know. But these spy agencies said there were weapons of mass destruction when there was the Gulf War. Um, and we brought that woman in front of the Congress to say that uh, she saw the Iraqis throw the babies out of the incubators. They must have known that she was the daughter of the ambassador to Kuwait and wasn't there at the time. And it's a felony to lie to Congress. Do you think these people aren't lying to you to get the uh, policies that they want, a policy to oppose Russia? And an anti-war movement has to stand against that. When they vilify people, we stop it. We say no. We don't give any credence to it. We got half of the left right now praising Comey, uh, for the head of the FBI who spied on every one of us. I have my FBI files. I know he spied on me. Um, he spied on all of us. He's not our friend, but the liberal 
part of the anti-war movement is now, now saying, well, he's a professional, he does things in a professional way. These agencies should be gotten rid of. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think we have to end. We're half hour over. I, I have quickly. to say one thing. It's one really, thing. really important. I, 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 I spent a year no investigating election fraud. There is something far more sinister than going on with this Russian narrative. It is obfuscating the actual election fraud that occurred. And I, I want to note that something that was not noted by this panel is the Department of Homeland Security took over the critical infrastructure of our elections three weeks before Donald Trump was appointed. And this has taken away the power for, from the state and the local municipa municipalities to have, um, to have say in decisions around um, uh, the kind of infrastructure we use, the voting machines. They have now control over the friggin' uh, uh, voting storage places. I have worked with election integrity activists all over the country who are horrified. The implications of this unconstitutional organization taking over our election systems uh, and declaring unconstitutionally for this, uh, this, this unconstitutional agency to have this authority is probably one of the biggest things, uh, and, and this was done on the rationalization of this Russian obfuscation and this lie. Please go to election fraud, wordpress.com, 2016. I have a 30 video series documenting the election fraud that occurred from state to state, C to signing C. We had a coup in 2016. Thank you.